Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy is not here today, and we have a guest in the building. Uh, she is a Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives, representing New York's 9th Congressional District, Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Brooklyn. In the house. <laughs> <laughs> good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Absolutely. It's a good day. It's kind of cloudy, but it's a good day. And one thing that you always talk about, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, is how much representation matters. And I love seeing you from Brooklyn, from Flappish, which is where I'm from, and seeing you so involved in the community. You're one person that I always see out and about doing different things. And I've even had the opportunity to participate on some of those panels and things that you've hosted. So let's talk about how important it is for you to be out there in the community in Brooklyn. It's, it's a labor of love. You know, I'm born and raised Brooklyn, so Brooklyn to the core. And when I'm I have the distinction of representing the district in which I was born and raised and still live. And so it's going home for me. It's being able to connect with the people who really helped shape me, uh, build me up, you know, uh, educate me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's touching base. It's really being home and comfortable with knowing that what I'm doing in Washington is going to impact so many people's lives. Has Brooklyn changed for the better or, or for the worse? Because you know people complain about yeah, gentrification. It, it's, a, it's a real dilemma. Uh, for those who have been displaced, it's for the worse. Uh, for those who are new coming to the community, it's a new opportunity for them to live a different way of life, mm -hmm. uh, to create. Uh, and there's a creative time and space that's happening. My concern is that it is, it's inclusive of everyone because right. it's, Brooklyn is such a very diverse the diverse borough and my district in particular is like ground zero for diversity. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm concerned. I want to be a bridge, quite frankly, towards what I call the longtime stakeholders and the newcomers, uh, because I think that, that we have a lot more in common than we have um, that divides us. But it seems as though we're seeing some instances where there's not the type of neighborliness. Right. You know what I'm saying? That I mean, that's what I grew up in. I grew up in neighborhoods where you know, community families were community families. Everybody helped raise you. Yeah, it's funny because I always, you know, for so long, gentrification was such a bad word, but it's not the gentrification, it's the displacement. It's the displacement. Absolutely. It's it's the fact that, um, you know, in my district, for instance, where there were families that lived in, like, wood frame homes, for instance. Um, those homes are being taken down. That was a family of maybe four. Now apartment building goes up in that space. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about 40 families, right? So it's a lot less personal in that people are sort of warehoused and maybe they get to know each other in the building, but the people on the block don't necessarily interact as much. And we need to bridge that gap. I always wonder why the people from Brooklyn that were black who had money back in the day, why didn't they get the inside track on what Brooklyn was going to well, be? Well, you know, I, I think they did, but it's a generational change. Right. It's also a generational change. Mm -hmm. Many parents bought these homes um, and their children didn't understand the value of that. Mm. And unfortunately, as the value of property went up, as, you know, water bills got more expensive, utilities life itself, uh, a lot of folks fell in arrears and um, we didn't have succession plans. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are some things that can be done? Because one thing, uh, as a person who I still live in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. one of the main things for people that are trying to move there, it is really hard to find affordable housing. Absolutely. What it, are some it, things that people can do and what can you do? Well, there are a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One, I think that um, stabilizing uh, the rents in Brooklyn that the state just did last week helps to anchor things a bit because we still have those affordable units. I think that we have to demand more of these developers and the city itself, right. quite frankly, in striking up better deals because we know that there are New Yorkers here looking, looking for affordable housing. We need to do more in that space. And we're looking at how we can deal with the hardest hit housing markets in Washington now. I have a bill in that would really provide funding through HUD and other means for home ownership. Mm. For because we got to continue to to buy homes, we got to get equity in society, right? Um, to make sure that we can undergird uh, the the subsidi subsidies that people need in order to really make that leap from what they make in their pockets and what the what the government can can provide. And let me say this: we need to also demand wages that really fit, you know, the the the. the the needs of the right. people of, of, you know, wages have been depressed in communities of color for way too long and continue to be that way. And so, I mean, 
the, the, uh, we fought so hard for, uh, you know, the $15 an hour minimum wage. It, it, we fought so long for it that now it, it, it has become irrelevant, quite frankly. I mean, not to minimize that. Mm -hmm. People are making far more than they were when they were making seven twenty five. But we delayed it for so long that that fifteen dollars is almost <laughs> what it was worth when we were making seven twenty five an hour. Wow. But is that tough for small business owners? It, it, it's really tough for small because there's business a balance owners. for that too. Because well, mm -hmm. it is, it is. You're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, the thing about it is that we we've got to look at how we strike that balance across the board. I know for small business owners, being able to get employees. Um, that they can afford is, you know, and maybe we have to look at w what we're talking about and exempt some small businesses from that. Mm -hmm. But there are some small businesses that are making multi-million dollar profits right. that can definitely not afford mine, to pay people a, more. No, I mean, no, we're not talking, <laughs> we're not talking mom and pop, sis. We're not talking mom and pop. We talk, you know, a, a certain, you know, there are ways to craft yeah. legislation so that we're not um, putting that burden on on our really small businesses that are trying to grow. Now, another yeah. thing about Brooklyn is Brooklyn has a huge West Indian community. Oh, yes. I know your family's from Jamaica. Absolutely. So Wagwan, brethren. Wagwan. <laughs> Wagwan. That's all he knows. I know. I know. I, know. I, li boop, I listen. Boop, boop, boop. I listen. <laughs> I listen to the show. So, so. I know there's uh, some things that have been happening with the Dreamers right now. Yes. So let's talk about that. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I'm so proud that I was the uh, lead sponsor on the a, Dream and Promise Act. The Dream and Promise Act, you know, and you know it. It's important. Uh, I know people personally who will benefit from this legislation. My district, as I tell people, is like right in the bullseye of everything that Donald Trump has done that has been so evil and, and so backward. And uh, there's so many young people in our constituency, and, and they're really not a lot of them, not, not that young anymore, but were bought here as children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have no choice. We went to school with them, they were in our class, mm -hmm. right? They're grown people now. Uh, they, some may own their homes, their children were born here, and they're in this limbo. You know, despite their challenges, they did everything that an American would do to advance their lives and their families and enhance our communities. And now you got this, you know, this gangster in the White House telling them, you know, but well, we don't know whether you're truly American or not. That's crazy. So then what happens to your home if you own your home? <laughs> That's a big question. I mean, there are real time ramifications if we don't pass this legislation. It's unfortunate that we've passed it in the House and the Senate hasn't taken it up yet. You know, the. Uh, you know, I, well, you I don't know like to not, make it. Though. Yeah, but I mean, the bottom line to it is th these folks live in their districts, too. Mm -hmm. You know, these folks um, are, are people who contribute to the, the civil society that that they represent. And so they have an obligation to take this up. And we, we, we tried once before. We were on the way to passing the DREAM Act. And, you know, the, the, they're these hardcore, you know, xenophobes is what mm. I call them, who don't want to see anyone. Uh, who's not doesn't look like them, doesn't right. act like them, doesn't believe like them to live in the United States of America, which is crazy. Can, can you tell us how immigrants will benefit directly off the Dream and Promise? Absolutely. It gives them a pathway to citizenship. Mm. Many of these individuals have no documents, right? So you want to make sure, first of all, they become residents of the United States. And then, you know, there's a pathway. Once you become a resident, you can become a citizen. Right. And that's that's what they deserve. And they're just right. flying below the radar right now, trying not to be noticed and they're, not to have people know their status. But they would do what they could do to legally be a citizen, but they're scared. They're paying tax. Is that you know they're doing everything that you would ask of someone to do living in our society, but they're doing it without having the the the, the legalization, if you will, mm -hmm. that you know gives them standing in our society, and that's what we need. That's what we need. And they may not want to fill out that census because some people feel like if I fill out this census form, then we you know, and, and we got to discourage that. We got to empower people. Mm -hmm. People have to know that there's power in the census. There's power in the vote. There's power in becoming a a citizen of the United States. And we've been doing a lot of citizenship drives as well. I ran into a sister the other day at an event and she came up and she pulled me aside. She hugged me. She said, I'm a citizen now. I'm a mm -hmm. citizen. Now. I mean, the joy in her heart. Because she sees the times we're in. People feel the anxiety of having someone in the White House that just hates their existence. Mm. Right? Right? For people who, who don't want this 
at this bill to pass. How does this like affect everyday Americans? Like when bills like this get passed and you know these people become citizens, how does this affect just regular Americans? When they become citizens? Yeah, how does it affect the just like us? Well, like, it strengthens us. You okay. know, the more people that we have that are eligible to vote, mm-hmm. you know, it, mm. it, it, it builds our ability to influence. That's what's so interesting about democracy is the fact that, you know, it's strengthened by uh, by our action, you know, and we saw that already. We saw that with the election of President Obama. We know that when all those votes came out, it made a difference, right? And it will always make a difference as long as we believe it makes a difference. We have a cause and a reason to get out there. And right now, Donald Trump is an existential threat to our community. So, I mean, if you don't feel the anxiety right. every day with this guy in office, then there's, you know, I, you're, you're not alive in America right now. And you're on board with trying to impeach him. Oh, right? I was on board the day after the <laughs> Women's March. I was like, on the, at the Women's March, like, let's impeach go, him get him out. Yeah, I saw what you said. You said, as members of Congress, we were elected to uphold the United States Constitution. We must do our job and ensure Donald Trump is held accountable. Mueller's statement has made it clear that it is time for Congress to take action. We owe this to the American people. Simply, we have too much to lose with our American democracy at stake. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Is that real? Is that real? There's a constitution that governs us. This guy has decided, you know, later for the for the for the constitution and the rule of law. And under that construct alone, anything can happen at any time because right. he's not being held accountable. And things have happened. Yeah, things how far? are happening. We got children in cages on the border. Mm. Of the United States of America. So sad to watch. And they it's just want to build painful. more places painful. to hold kids. You think Congress is being cowards when it comes to calling for the impeachment of Donald I Trump? I think some people in Congress are being cowards. There are mm. a lot of us that are stepping up and doing our job. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of Republicans who are fearful. You know, either that or they're in cahoots with what's taking place. Mm-hmm. Both of which are dangerous to this nation. And you feel I, like I see a lot of the Democrats tap toe too, though. Like, just, just saying, like, well, I don't know if impeachment is the right way. That's like, they, you know, Listen, there are some folks, I mean, there, there is a debate that's raging right mm-hmm. now. It's like, do we impeach him now? Do we impeach him later? It's basically what we're mm-hmm. saying. Some people are saying, well, let's get the evidence out there, make sure the American people are educated, informed. They know exactly what Mueller has in his report so that they see tangibly what we're talking about. Um, And then there are others that are saying we can reveal that to the American people by starting the inquiry. So it's a matter of What's when the most and effective how, way? Exactly. What's the most effective way? And for me, like you from Brooklyn. Yeah. You, you called Donald Trump a gangster earlier. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's definitely a gangster. He's definitely a bully. <laughs> Eventually, you got to stand up to the bully. Absolutely. What's the part? When, what are they waiting on we, to stand up to the bully? Listen, you know, I, I, I guess some folk, uh, you know, are not accustomed mm-hmm. to dealing with bullies and gangsters, right? Uh, we know that uh, you have nothing to lose. At the end of the day, either you're going to accept your subordination or you're going to fight back against it. That's right. And the resistance is real. The resistance is real and we all need to be down with it because at the end of the day, we inherit this, mm-hmm. right? Our children inherit mm-hmm. this. Our our grandchildren inherit this. And they're going to look us in the eye and they're going to say, what did you do when they elected Donald Trump? Because this is an aberration. Uh, perhaps it's something that was supposed to occur for the American people to really understand what their power is, communities of color understand what their power is and exercise that power. Like a wake up call for Absolutely. Because we look at women's rights right now and that's something that has me really fearful as well. Mm-hmm. As well as immigration, just seeing what's happening with everybody trying to overturn Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Can you see that really happening here in the United States? Yes. Right now. Absolutely. Right now. In New York even? Listen, I think, you know, New York State is... Um, is somewhat insulated from a lot of what's happening federally, but that doesn't stop the federal government from coming in and trying to shut down clinics, right? right. Or cut off the funding to those clinics, right? So we will have the battle, right? We Our laws will not change as a state. But remember, oftentimes the federal government has the power to preempt mm-hmm. whatever states and municipalities do. So we're in, you know, we're in a battle. And I think that we need to turn that fear into fierceness, Mm -hmm. you know, get out there, do what we do, make sure that our people come out and vote and um, 
you know, let's make this happen for our children and our grandchildren and our communities. And I, I just feel like if you don't draw a line in the sand now and say enough is enough, like how far will be too far for Donald Trump? This is dangerous times, yeah. you know, because it's, 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 you know, some of it you don't want to believe is intentional, right? That it's just, you know, stupidity. But, you know, whether it's intentional or it's stupidity, it's dangerous. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on on multiple levels right now that are existential threats to our society, to us as human beings, to us as women, to, you know, to us as people of color. Uh, you can go down the line if you're Muslim, if you're an immigrant, you know, if you're a woman, you know, if you live in a community where there aren't a whole lot of resources available all of the most vulnerable in our society are really being, um, you know, messed with right now. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that this is real. It's happening. And uh, if you feel anxiety in the morning like I do sometimes, mm -hmm. embrace it because this should not be our normality. This should not be real. This should be something that we're fighting against. Now, you also come from a very politically active family. Your mom is well-loved yeah. in the community. So let's talk about that and what got you into politics and your mom even. Yeah. So my mother's name is Dr. Una S.T. Clark. Um, a, some, a lot of people call her Mother Una. Mm -hmm. um, I call her Mama. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I attribute a lot of who I am and what I do and um, just my view to life to, to her. Uh, both of my parents came from Jamaica, as I said, but they came in the 1950s. So they've been living in the United States uh, the vast majority of their lives. They're in their 80s now. And uh, my mother, as a way of navigating the society, decided that she was going to be activist. She got involved with everything, whether it was my public school education or, you know, just the block association. She, you know, she was that, that sister on the block, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, she always gave to others. She found out how to navigate the system and the educated and informed as many people as she could. She was an organizer. She used to uh, protest all the time. And uh, my brother and I, my father, we would all be in these, these movements because <laughs> my mother had already staked out the lay of the land and said, we need to be involved with this. And, and we got involved as a family. And oftentimes, you know, when she was involved in her meetings and what have you, I was the one that she would take with her because she didn't have babysitters. She couldn't afford a mm -hmm. babysitter, right? So um, she really set the, the, the tone for uh, the passion that I feel around people and engaging them. Uh, but then she went on even further uh, to run for office. And this happened when I was already a young adult. My mom became a city councilwoman. She was the first foreign-born woman to be elected Amazing. to the New York City Council. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, the rest is history. I, when she was term limited, I, uh, I was offered the opportunity to, to run uh, for that seat in, in the 40th Council District, which is Flatbush. And uh, I was successful. So that made us the first ever and only mm -hmm. mother-daughter succession wow. in the history of the city council. And when they come out to events, people are so excited to see <laughs> the two of them together. So I just think I love my mama. And because Aside representation, from everything else. Yeah, yeah. I think so, it's such a big deal. It's good for people to see that. Absolutely. So when you was a kid, like, were you, were you soaking up that game? When she thought she was just bringing you along because she thought that she didn't <laughs> have a babysitter, you were soaking it all I in? I was soaking it all in. Yeah. That's the thing about it. I, I think that parents underestimate the influence they have on their kids oftentimes. Um, but my mom would put me in the room with every or everyone else and I would just be listening to how they were organizing the issues that they were passionate about, what they were gonna do to the to the status quo and, and the powers that be, and to see them execute on it and to be a beneficiary of what they executed on, right? So my parent, my mother really organized around education. And uh, there was a period of time in, in Brooklyn where the school system was not, well, back in my day, properly educating the children, mm -hmm. right? Fast forward, unfortunately, we're in that space again. But what my mother and her peers did was they took over the school system. And in doing so, they took over the curriculum and how we were taught. And so I got one of the best educations mm -hmm. you could possibly get in New York City public schools, so much so that it enabled me to get a, a college scholarship wow. strictly through through public schools in my district. And so, so when I take see, over again. 
That's what I believe. I think when parents get to the point where they recognize that they can really impact the education of their own children, it'll make a, a profound difference. You mentioned the 2020 election. Mm-hmm. And you introduced a bill to combat high tech altered videos. I don't even know what that means, but if it prevents uh, foreign interference in the 2020 election, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all for yeah. it. So, so what yeah. is it exactly? So deep fakes. Mm-hmm. We've seen some of those deep where... fakes. Deep fakes. These, These videos go are viral. videos that have been deeply fakerized. Okay. In other words, there there are technologies at our disposal now that enable us to take a video deconstructed and reconstructed in such a seamless fashion that it seems real. Right. And people believe it. And people believe it. And, you know, it's basically playing tricks with your mind. Yes. And when you see the real video, you know that it was a real departure from the content of that video in order to really fake out and make people think that what they've seen is real. And when we adhere to that, we take in so much video now, right? That's just a way of life for so many people. Um, It can cause uh, adverse reactions. It manipulates the behaviors of people. And so it's important to me that we distinguish that. Uh, You know, I'm for all for the First Amendment, but if you're going to put out a fake video, you got to put a disclaimer that says, this is a fake video. Has that ever happened to you? No, it hasn't happened to Ooh. me, but I know of other people. Right. And, and it's been happening. It's hard to combat that, It's been that happening too. to sisters for a while. Once people believe you said something, even yeah. if you're like, I never said that, right. this was altered. Yeah. Imagine trying to prove that you didn't say something that a video was out and it looks like you said it. Well, we saw a shallow fake with, with Nancy Pelosi, right? They mm-hmm. just slowed down the video to mm-hmm. make, and it made her look as though right. she were intoxicated. Right. So imagine what you can do. <laughs> Uh, with artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Well, imagine what you can do with augmented intelligence. And that's what people are using. You know, they have not, nothing better else to do with their <laughs> time. But that stands for domestically mm-hmm. and internationally because so much of what we consume now is coming from around the world. And we know we have adv- adversaries, right, who have already gone into our systems and determined the outcome of an election, mm-hmm. right? So... We might as well not play stupid and prepare for this. And that's what my legislation does. It's not just videos, though. It's just content, period. Absolutely. Like all of the tweets and the Facebook statements. And it's like, I'm like, I don't know if I said that. Did this person really well, say that? Well, when you have a president that lies from day one and keeps lying. Oh, he's the best. You know, keeps lying. That's crazy. You got to kind of respect it a little bit. I, I can't respect no, it. I, you you can't I cannot respect, respect that Listen, game. There is no, no <laughs> respect in the game. No, like, 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 like a week ago, or maybe it was like two weeks ago, when he called <laughs> Meghan Markle nasty, and they but then he, he tweeted out, <laughs> I didn't say that. Well, the fake news apologized to me, and then they played the audio, and he doesn't do no rebuttals, no apologies, no Let's nothing. Let's just start just with crowd size. Let's just start with you crowd size. Why are we even getting down to that? Yeah. We saw it with our own eyes, right? Come on. That, you know, that's playing tricks with, your, with, with people's heads. And, and, and when you do that over and over and over again, if you normalize it, mm-hmm. you, don't, you begin to lose reality. Yeah. You know? And so we've got, I mean, we're dealing with a barrage of all, kind, all manners of, of mind games, of, um, you know, trickery, um, gangster moves, and... and we got to get ourselves out of it. I feel like he's tapped into something that people created, meaning mm. meaning that whole energy on social media where you don't know what's real and what's not real. I just think he's a reflection of that. Absolutely, but he's mastered it because he's been able to go to different media outlets to create mm-hmm. an echo chamber, right? Mm-hmm. So whether it's um, you know on on social media or it's on television, I mean, he just sat down with George Stephanopoulos and lied. You know? It's like crazy. It's, I mean, it's like... What kind of movie are we in? <laughs> it, it, it's real, though. <laughs> yeah. It's real, though. I, I, I saw you uh, tweet out um, about what happened to Senator Kamala Harris. Yeah. When somebody rushed her on the stage, you yeah. said it keeps you playing in your yeah. mind. Why, why did that disturb Yeah, that's not good. Nah. That is not good. You know... That's what she needs. That she needs somebody was, from Brooklyn on that, stage That with sister her. Was, was vulnerable. Um, we don't know what that dude... You know, could have been carrying. Absolutely. And, you know, it didn't have to be a weapon. It could have been acid. It could have been a whole bunch of other things that, you know, and given the climate that we're in, 
Um, you know, it, it, people are very um, aggressive mm-hmm. and hostile. Uh, we can't play with the security of our candidates and, and sisters in particular. When folk feel like they can just step up, absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. there were a whole host of other folk who came and sat down on the MoveOn.org stage. That dude chose Kamala Harris to mm-hmm. get in her face. Right. Right. What's that about? Yeah. I have issue, you know, and I've seen it happen before with other sisters, including mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. You know, the boldness, and so I think that uh, we got to get a respect realm. You know, set around our politicians, our women, our black women, as well as the proper security for someone who's a candidate for the United States of America. Because when stuff like that happens to artists, right? Mm, Rappers. Yeah. You get on that stage, you're getting your ass kicked. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that should have happened to that person. Absolutely. And, and, and that, well, you got to set husband, an example. Her husband got she up there, got but. Up, yeah. and, 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 and we got to <laughs> give it to Kimberly Jean Pierre. That's just that she. I, I think Kimberly's from Brooklyn. She jumped up so up, quick. Yeah. She was like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Mm, you know, today. she put her body on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do you think this is the most, as far as in the time period that you've been involved in politics, mm-hmm. does it feel like the most hostile time? It is. Absolutely. It's, it's always, really? there, there's always been, you know, there's always been pushback, but it's so in your face right now, you know, because Donald Trump has given license all of those folks to act out on their hostility. They feel emboldened. They oh, feel big time. supported. Come on, look at all the incidents that are happening right now. You know, these are things that people would have thought twice about, but now they've been given permission by Donald Trump encouraged. to be out, encouraged, encouraged. It's out of control. Why, why are black people so in love with Joe Biden? I, you know, I haven't done a poll, my brother, so I don't know how. I don't know how deep it goes. I don't know how deep it goes. Um, they did listen. do some early polling to mm-hmm. see that Joe Biden in some major states is ahead of uh, Donald Trump. He's Absolutely. upset about that. Well, I think, you know, he's familiar mm-hmm. to a lot of That's folks. That's true. That, you know, he's been around he's been a lot of black communities. It's not like he's not new to black folks. He's, you know, been at churches, been out there on certain causes. So I think it's the familiarity. And they but they also equate him with Obama as well. That's what I've heard. Mm-hmm. That's what I've heard. But um, I just, I, look, I just mm-hmm. look at him and I, you know, I, I see how they held Hillary accountable for the 94 crime bill, mm-hmm. even though she wasn't in the administration. And they give Senator Harris hell for being a prosecutor, saying she locked black and brown people up. Joe Biden wrote the 94 crime bill. Well, you know, it's also, listen, let's not forget. And I'm not, you know, I don't want us to ever lose Uh, this in the last election what was done by the Russian government Mm -hmm. to amp up stuff in communities of color in you know the uh, right wing Mm -hmm. communities created far more of um, an impression that that's where people were from and convinced some folk to question you know what was happening in reality and what was in their best interest Mm -hmm. right so I expect that that will be the case again. Mm. And so we have got to, again, don't normalize this stuff. Understand that when when people want to get in your head, they will do certain things over and over and over again to get you. It's like a brainwashing to a certain extent. Right. So will. Do we hold folk accountable for what they've done in the past? What I would say is if they can speak to the American people and show how they have grown, how their perspectives have changed, how this is, you know, 2020, not 1996, 1993, and this is where our society has evolved to, and I have too, then I think we need to give folk the benefit of the doubt. We got to look for leadership in this moment because... The end, the era of Donald Trump is going to come to an end. And what I would say, Maybe. it's going to come to an end might, one way or another. It's going to come point. to an end. It's not, yeah. you know, he's, one he's, way or another. He's sick just, enough to be like, I'm going to be here forever. Yeah, he's sick <laughs> enough to do that. But we sick enough out here to say, oh, no, you not. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. The people are going to say, oh, no, you not. So how that plays itself out, we will see should it come to that. But what I'm saying is that I believe that we have to look out for our own interests and look for the candidates that are speaking to those interests that are going to move our communities forward, that are going to deal with our social justice agenda, deal with our economic agenda, 
deal with our housing dilemma, that they're going to be out there, you know, for us. Mm -hmm. And we got to find that candidate. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to hear right now. I haven't decided who I'm backing. I got two New Yorkers in the race, you know. Who do you like? Is anybody you? Well, there there are quite a few folk that I like. (laughs) There are quite a few folk that I like. Because you see Bill de Blasio as president? Anything can happen, right? You know, no. uh, <laughs> that, that <one> can't. <laughs> that's you. I'm not even getting into that one. That's my brother. I'm not saying nothing further. <laughs> now, other, other than media attention, is it effective when celebrities come and talk at Capitol Hill in front of Congress? We've been seeing that a lot the past I few think, weeks. I think it is simply because the uh, the popular culture embraces um, celebrity a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. And to the extent that those celebrities are speaking to real people's issues, like I thought John Stewart was oh, like, man. wow. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because the reality is somebody needed to be shamed around. Him. Right. Yeah. And it depends on who the celebrity is. It too, does. I'm sure, and what it they does. Say. Yeah. It absolutely. Like Kanye. Hello. In the White House. I don't yeah, know. That did, wasn't nah. effective. That was not effective. Because <laughs> uh, in the past couple of weeks, I was there with T.I. for opportunities on yes, legislation. That was nice. And I was there with. I'm uh, glad y'all came. Thank you. And I was there mm-hmm. with Sister Taraji for, you know, mental health and yes. school, social emotional learning. She was awesome. And I, like it gets a lot of attention. I just wonder how you well, know, how I effective think, is it to actually getting legislation? Well, right? it's, it's well, it's, it's important for us to get their testimony on the record because we're going to move with the legislation. But what it also does is it builds public awareness right. so that when we put those bills out there and the Republicans keep acting the fool, the public's going to say what, you, what What? are you doing? Mm. It'll always they'll always be reminded right. of those individuals who you know, came out of their comfort zones. I'm sure Taraji didn't want to get up, but she understood the imperative, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. Gotcha. Can I ask you something um, before we get out of here? Mm-hmm. We were talking about Oprah and Ava and Gail King and how they don't like being called auntie. Do people call you auntie Yvette? No, thank God. <laughs> wait a <laughs> minute, wait a minute. Hold on a moment, hold on a moment. I don't mind. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with it. As long as they not like disparaging me, I'm right. with it. I got three nephews. <laughs> I love them boys, right? And they call me Aunt Yvette, auntie Yvette. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think it's a big issue. I mean... You know, people want to be called what they want to be called. Right. And um, I wouldn't have you an said, issue with it. You said no, thank God. It. I did. That was my initial reaction. Right, but you know, that was, okay. that was my, I, I'm not at that stage yet. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, give the sister a little bit more time, you know. Mm-hmm. But listen, you know, as long as people feel like I'm looking in their best interest, and I think that's what aunties typically yes. kind of take. The cool the, auntie. It's that auntie that is always looking out for the best interest. And, yeah, I'm that cool auntie. All right. Definitely. <laughs> All well, right. Auntie Yvette, thank you. Um, uh, for coming. Uh, Charlemagne, <laughs> you know, you had well, to go there. Congresswoman. <laughs> you had to go Yvette there. Clark. Hello. Always a pleasure to see you. It's I'm such very a happy pleasure that to you're be up here, here. representing Brooklyn, representing Brooklyn, Flatbush. In the house. Do you see the t shirt? Mm hmm. Yeah. Hey. In the house. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything we need to know before you go? Um, We're going to be naming a post office after my uh, my predecessor, Congressman Major Owens, on June 28th at the St. John's Place Mm -hmm. uh, post office in Brooklyn. Y'all come out, show your love for Congressman Major R. Owens. And we happy Biggie got a street named after him, too. Oh, that was the bomb. I wish I could have been there. I was in Washington, but I see everybody out there. Wasn't Little Kim on stage, too? Yep. Yep. Little that was, C's, D-Rock. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, his mother, Ms. M- Ms. Wallace. Uh, good work. Good work for those people in the New York City Council that made that happen. Shout out to Council Member Lori Cumbo, Councilman Rob Cornegy, and anyone else who was instrumental in making that Spike happen. Spike Lee got a street last year, yeah. too. Yeah, well, you know, these are our icons. Yes. These are our icons, so... It, well worth it. And it was great to see Miss Wallace as well. You know, she another yachty. Hey. <laughs> well, thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you. Yvette Clark for coming. Thank you for having it's me. It's the Breakfast Club. <laughs>